I'm Carol Ann Riddell and this is Science and You. Today we're going to meet some people who are committed to science, from looking into the future to protecting our plants and animals, to making science accessible and interesting to everyone, no matter their age. First, we meet Dr. Michio Kaku, professor of theoretical physics at City College of New York and a best-selling author. Ernabel DeMillo sat down with him to talk about his work. If we were to meet our great-grandkids of the year 2100, we will think of them as gods. You heard him right, gods. In the future, Michio Kaku predicts we will have technology that will make us seem like the gods of Greek mythology. Venus had a perfect body. She was also had a timeless body. We will have that as well. And then Apollo rode on a chariot across the sky. We will have flying cars, finally. And then Pegasus was the winged horse. We will be able to have zoos of extinct animals. We'll be able to resurrect animals that have been dead for tens of thousands of years. This all sounds like a science fiction movie. Hard to believe? Well, just imagine what life was like for our great-great-grandparents. Think of our ancestors of the year 1900. They were dirt farmers. They only lived to their 40s. If they were to see us today, they would look at us as sorcerers and wizards with rocket ships, satellites, GPS, and all this uh, high-tech wizardry. In his book, Physics of the Future, Kaku takes readers through the next 100 years, and he makes what may seem like bold predictions. For instance, smartphones will be so 2011. The Internet will be in our contact lens. I will blink, and when I see you, I'll see your biography listed next to you. And if you're speaking to me in Chinese or Urdu, I'll see a translation of that. And who will buy these Internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> Kaku also predicts cancers and tumors will soon be just a flush away from a cure. I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists. And when I interview the doctors, they tell me that your toilet will be the cure for cancer. How's that? Because your toilet will have what are called DNA chips that analyze proteins emitted from 100 cancer cells in a cancer colony 10 years before a tumor forms. The word tumor could disappear from the English language. We will also zap cancer with what are called smart molecules or nanoparticles. These already exist. Every prediction in my book, and I make hundreds of predictions, have a prototype in the laboratory. And an idea proposed 100 years ago may soon be a reality. A regular citizen like me could just go on an elevator, press the up button, and uh, it'll take me up to space. Right. Right now, if you had 20 million bucks, you can hitch a ride on the International Space Station. 20 million bucks. If you have $200,000, you can hitch a ride on Spaceship Two. You go up 70 miles and down 70 miles. Okay, I have neither. <laughs> But what about the average uh, Joe and Jane? How are they going to go into outer space? That's where the space elevator comes in. So what will keep that elevator from tipping over? It doesn't fall down because of the centrifugal force of the Earth as it spins. Because right now you are moving at 1,000 miles an hour because the Earth's circumference is 24,000 miles and they're 24 hours in a day. So you're, you're moving at 1,000 miles an hour. And so because this line going into outer space is also moving at 1,000 miles per hour, that's why it doesn't fall. Wow. You know, I got a, a C in physics. <laughs> I think if you were my professor, I might have done much better. Since that interview, Dr. Kaku has written another book, The Future of the Mind. When you watch a superhero in action on the screen, the plot seem believable. In fact, some of the things you first see in fiction have come true. Think lasers. But how does Hollywood get it right? Well, they go to guys like Kevin Grazier, who works with producers to make sure they get the science right. Mike Gilliam has the story. His name is Dr. Kevin Grazier, and he has a PhD in planetary physics. He's the type of guy that helps a Spider-Man snare you in his web, allows Wolverine to draw you in, and makes Batman the true caped crusader. He's worked on Battlestar Galactica, Eureka, and The Event. And he says producers try to get the science right. Hollywood producers want to ground their series in accurate science. You want to create more moments that make the viewer say, wow, and fewer that make them say, oh, please. Because when you make a viewer say, oh, please, with bad science, 
they transform from someone who's immersed in your creative vision to someone who's sitting among four walls the 21st century feeling cheated like they could have done that much better. Grazier says it's not so much that the science has to be accurate as to feel accurate. So that the viewer says, wow, that could happen. And if you've done all of your homework along the way, the audience is much more likely to take a leap with you later. So what about Spider-Man? Spider-Man, one of my favorites. Uh, bitten by a radioactive spider. You notice that over the years, from the 60s to the more recent incarnations, as we've learned more about DNA, the, the story behind the, the spider has actually changed. So, there, so the, the creators of the more recent Spider-Man and then the reboot, the, the new new Spider-Man, ha have done their homework and, and attempted to, to incorporate newer science in the creation of Peter Parker. How about the Hulk? Dr. Banner was, was irradiated with gamma rays. Now, let's go back into the 50s and 60s. It was always radiation. Radiation could do anything. Batman is a different story. Batman is really just a high-tech driven superhero. I mean, yeah, he's in great shape, and yes, he knows how to fight, and, and et cetera, and, and so yes, he's a martial artist, uh, both internally and with the, 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 the skill, but really it's his tech. He has a whole huge, you know, Wayne Enterprises supporting him. So in that case, the science creates the superhero in many respects. How do you make sure that that is believable from a scientific standpoint? So you could start from the beginning, you could incorporate science before you even start writing, or at the very end when the screenplay is written, you hand it to someone who red pens it and say, well, no, you, that this could be improved, this could be improved, this doesn't happen, but maybe this, this could, etc. Now, do you ever have a situation where you're doing that, you're red penning something, and a guy says, oh, wait a minute, my creative vision is here, and this is the storyline. I can't let the science get in the way. Story wins every time. The science advisor, if, if the science doesn't work, it's incumbent upon a science person to find something that does. If this science doesn't work, hey, maybe this does. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take process. We're sitting here in Grand Central. They're about to celebrate their centennial. What is the one superhero movie that stands out in your mind that took place here? One of my favorites, one that kind of flew under the superhero radar, in my opinion, Unbreakable. Bruce Willis, um, awesome performance. Uh, I think kind of flew under the radar because people expected it to be Sixth Sense Part Two, but Bruce Willis literally stood right here and you know, in a very iconic moment, in my opinion, holding out his hands, touching people, as uh, sensing their life story as they brush past. Fantastic movie, fantastic place. Again, one of, one of my favorites. But when it comes to what movie did the best job of using science to make a superhero seem believable, Grazier says one stands out. Wolverine. Wolverine, um, his claws, his adamantium skeleton, that's not a superpower. That's a side effect of his superpower. He has incredible healing properties, or had incredible ability to heal, which allowed him to survive the process. So his, his fighting skill comes from technology, but it was his, his healing ability that allowed him to survive that. I think that's the most believable of the of superheroes in, in my mind. Bottom line, um, how important is the science to the superhero genre? Marginally important. Um, people who watch the superhero movies um, don't expect super accurate science. I believe they like it when you've made the attempt to ground your story in accurate science. If you tell a plausible backstory, they'll go with you on the journey when you're, you've pushed a little bit more into the, in the more fantastic elements. Kevin continues his role as science advisor on several projects and has a new book, Holly Weird Science, coming out in May about how science and scientists are portrayed on the big and small screens. Barry Mitchell introduces us to a respected scientist, Ronald Probstein, who grew up in Times Square, but for him, his father and mother, it wasn't bright lights and glamour. Everybody else's father worked at a regular job, brought home a regular amount of money, and my father was a, a gambler and a bookie. We're at the Cafe Edison on West 47th Street, an authentic vestige of 1930s era Times Square, to talk with Ronald Probstein about his memoir, Honest Sid. 
Dr. Probstein is Ford Professor of Science Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's written many scholarly works, but today, it's all in the family. Honest was my father. He was liked by everyone in Times Square. When you're not living within the law, but just on the edge of it, it's better that you be honest, otherwise you wind up with broken legs. Sid was sure the racetrack would make him rich. He scalped tickets to Broadway shows. And when he gambled away the rent, he sneaked down the fire escape with his wife, Sally, and young Ronald. When you're a five-year-old kid, your mother drags you out in the middle of the night and drags you onto the fire escape. It's a little scary. Did you grow up and become a success because of or despite your upbringing? That's a very good question. Both my father and my mother, irrespective of what our situation was, were crazy about me. As bad as things were, they always tried to make sure that they, I was taken care of. And Stuyvesant High School took care of nurturing Ronald's love of math and science. And before that, he was inspired by a particular movie. The H.G. Wells, Things to Come. And that dealt with rocketry, going to the moon, building new cities in different planets. I don't even think I knew what being a scientist was. I just said, that's an awful lot of fun to do that. And now for the rule of the earth and a new life for mankind. What is ballistic missile reentry physics? Well, I worked on what was called hypersonic flow. That's the speed of flight or flow at many times the speed of sound. Incorporating principles of hypersonic flow in the design of missiles and spacecraft keeps them from disintegrating upon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. I, with my colleague, more or less developed the theory of this flow. You wrote the book on synthetic fuels, isn't that true? That is true, yes. Among synthetic fuels, the most important, I believe, will be those that are made and derived from coal. That doesn't mean you're burning dirty coal. The fuels that you get and the process you use in making them can be very clean. The gases that are produced in them are easily captured. The fuel you'll get will be the same fuel that you pump out of your gas station right now. You knew, or at least you met, Albert Einstein. Tell us about that. Every person that I know that it goes into the physical sciences at one time or another becomes fascinated with relativity theory. And I was fascinated with it and I was reading his work and I saw another way of approaching a particular equation. This was an alternative and somewhat simpler approach to the same endpoint. Yours was E equals MC triangle. No, no, it, I don't, didn't tell you that. I, it wasn't that. And so I wrote it up and I went to his house in Princeton. Were you invited? No. You just showed up at his doorstep. Well, I had an, I told him that a friend of mine, who was a friend of his, uh, said I should go. He was a true gentleman, very, very nice, and he took it. And then he told me when to come back, and I came back again. He had looked at it, and he said it was fine, very good, very pleasant to me. And those were my two times of meeting him. How much of your success did Honest Sid live to see? Ah, uh, that was wonderful. He Just, took great pride in your accomplishments. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> it was embarrassing. I mean, sometimes he would exaggerate so much it was terrible. When we were going to get married in 1950, he told all the, the Damon Runyon characters in the Broadway scene here that Einstein was going to be at our wedding. <laughs> I loved him. I was crazy about him. Well, I realized that was his life and I had my life. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you, sir. Dr. Ronald Probstein, the book is Honest Sid, Memoir of a Gambling Man, available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Since we broadcast Honest Sid in 2011, the Cafe Edison has closed, but Dr. Probstein is still up in Boston. His latest project is urging the development of a hypersonic transport plane, which could fly at greater speeds than five times the speed of sound. 
Well, they're former cheerleaders, not who you might expect to be knee-deep in laboratories. These women are leading the cheer for science. So this was the uniform I wore for a lot of my time. The little skirt. Wait, and as little it is, look at that. <laughs> Meet Dr. Amanda Adelier, a former professional cheerleader who traded her pom-poms for a lab coat. Growing up, Amanda loved math and science. She also loved to dance and joined her school dance team. One thing led to another, and Amanda ended up as a professional cheerleader for the St. Louis Rams while she also attended college. How did you manage to keep all that together? Staying organized, which is something I think is really important for anybody in general and especially in the sciences. So I double majored in biology and in the classics, so basically Latin. And I just made sure I picked my courses in a way that, you know, if I could take the early morning class, I would do the early morning class and then be able to study in the afternoon, get everything done, go to practice and just, you know, keep everything in a very, on a very tight ship. When she isn't busy with patients at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center, Amanda spends some of her time as a science cheerleader. What, you might ask, is that? Exactly what it sounds like. The science cheerleaders are current and former professional cheerleaders who are pursuing careers in the sciences. Their mission is to inspire young women and encourage everyone to get educated about science. And they deliver that message with all the spunk you'd expect. The group is the brainchild of Darlene Cavalier, a former cheerleader for the Philadelphia 76ers, and a passionate advocate for getting the public engaged in science. Nothing is black and white. There is no easy answer to any issue we have. Stem cells, climate change, genetically engineered food, there are so many different thought processes that go into this. There's a sliver for you to add to that conversation. Are you essentially trying to get people, regular people like me, to sort of get in touch with their inner scientist? That is a great way to put it. Not everybody knows that they have an inner scientist. And some sometime in all of our lives, we had an inner scientist. It might have been when you were two years old. At some point, you're curious. You're a builder. I mean, there's a reason why kids love to build blocks. And they ask a lot of questions. That is your inner scientist. And then I don't know what we do to beat it out of kids, you know, and turn them off to science. Um, but it's never too late. The other goal in this is to challenge the stereotypes people may have of scientists and cheerleaders. The combination is not as unlikely as some might believe. The science cheerleaders are made up of more than 200 professional cheerleaders, now in science and engineering. As Amanda explains, the skills she learned as a cheerleader have helped her become a doctor. One of the things I think that's subtle is when you're dancing, you have to be very aware of everybody around you. You're in a team and you're constantly being seen as a unit. You're not an individual. And I think in medicine, that's also critical. You are always working in a team. You and drawing little girls in with the glitter of pom-poms and sparkly uniforms can be a great opportunity to talk about careers in science, particularly those long considered male dominated. It changes, you know, sort of the way that they're thinking, and it opens their mind. And I think that that's what's really great about science cheerleaders. And I suppose it shows them that, hey, you can be a cheerleader, but you can be a scientist, too. Exactly. They're not mutually exclusive. These do not have to be separate lives, right? We can figure out a way to tie all of this and the teamwork and the optimism and all the great things here into science careers. An update for you, Darlene tells us they've now come out with a Science of Cheerleading ebook, and the organization has grown to more than 300 members. In 2012, we traveled to upstate New York to meet psychology professor William Crane, who is a modern day Dr. Doolittle, taking care of rescue farm animals at his safe haven farm sanctuary. It's really not good for us to be so isolated from the rest of nature. I, I think there's something really missing. My name is Bill Crane. I'm a professor of psychology at the City College of New York. Over the years, I found myself feeling more sympathy for the animals and I started to learn more, especially in the 90s, about the abusive conditions on factory farms and especially about how animals are treated and how they're 
crammed together and how they don't have a natural life. And I wanted to do something. And the idea of uh, a farm sanctuary appealed to me because we could rescue some of them, of the animals, and then have it open to visitors so they could see a little about what the animals are like. The study of animal behavior has led to attachment theory, how babies, human babies, get attached to their mothers. That is based on observations of animals. And I thought this would be a chance to really learn about animals. I've been interested in them and teach about them. So I thought if I taught about animal behavior out of the books, it wouldn't be the same as if I knew something about animals. And so another motive was to get some first-hand experience and learn about animals. And one of the, the things I've tried to pursue is and get people to understand is that children need contact with the natural world. That's what that. produces, stimulates so much of their curiosity. And at the farm, I've been more and more impressed that it brings out another quality, which is their capacity to care for others. The animals, they spontaneously care about animals. They want to help them. First, they want to hug them, but then they want to take care of them. They, they worry you see about them. You see these nurturant feelings coming up. And I think most of us want children to grow up to be caring. As children become removed from the natural world, which is a crisis now, really, uh, the, the fine qualities are diminished. And, I wrote a book, Reclaiming Childhood, and the central chapter is in there is called The Child as a Naturalist, and it, it, I try to draw out the benefits for the child uh, for, in, in having rich contact with the natural world. And one of the qualities, it, 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 nature stimulates their imagination, their creativity, their powers for patient observation. The children need time in the natural world, and they need time to be around animals. And if they can do that, uh, their emotional health will benefit. In natural settings, there's a, a sense of peacefulness that comes over a child, a sense of calm, a sense of being part of something larger than herself. I do feel kind of some degree of acknowledgement that they are gentle, comfortable around me. They seem to be peaceful in my presence, because usually they're not. Usually they don't like humans, so you see them just relaxing, and uh, it's sort of an honor to me. It's a high honor. Like a lot of people would like to, to get praise from their peers or their colleagues or make a lot of money. To me, it's an honor to be accepted by these turkeys. It's, it would be good for children, it's good for all of us if we could get back to the natural world. Dr. Crane has since written a book called The Emotional Lives of Animals and Children, and Safe Haven Farm Sanctuary now has over 100 animals and continues to grow. As you might expect, the ocean and its seaweed is fascinating to scientists. But Donna Hanover found an artist and author who's written a book about it. I happened to take a scrap of seaweed and hold it up to the sky. And that was really this, this aha moment for me because I was struck with this magnificence of form and this really this intense magenta color. That's just one of its beauties, according to artist Josie Islin, the author of An Ocean Garden. As a visual artist and a designer, I really uh, want to use this kind of wow factor of how, how fantastically beautiful seaweed is to bring people into the science of seaweed. Most people don't think of seaweed as being beautiful. They think of it as getting tangled in their feet and being kind of brown and yucky. Well, one of the, um, the things about seaweed is we don't see it in its, in its most natural state. We see it at low tide uh, when it's uh, hanging very unceremoniously over the rocks. Um, it kind of drapes there. It's goopy. Uh, but when the tide comes in, it uses the buoyancy of the, of the ocean water. Seaweeds are magnificent photosynthesizers. They um, use a range of pigments to gather sunlight, splitting water molecules uh, and combining it with carbon dioxide and coming up with organic growth and oxygen. Oxygen. And oxygen is what 
what makes our planet go. Josie uses a scanner rather than a camera to record images of seaweed. As a photographer, daylight, incandescent light, fluorescent light all creates different, uh, a different color um, situation for your camera, whereas the scanner allows me to capture very true color. The greens um, have uh, just chlorophyll in their cells as their light grabbing uh, pigment. And the browns have an accessory pigment. That brown pigment combines with the green and makes this array of olive colors, golden yellows, uh, and, and deep brown. Mm -hmm. And then there's the reds that have just one chlorophyll A, but they also have a blue and a red accessory pigment. Josie grew up on the coast of Maine, lives now on the coast of Northern California, and has authored several books about ocean stones and nearshore life. For an ocean garden, she scanned some seaweed specimens that had been stored by scientists in herbariums. She dried some of her own, and then there were the wet ones. This was a very large specimen that kind of draped over the sides of the scanner, but I had to capture it wet because the bull kelp, when it dries, it dries into this dark, very uninteresting thing, whereas when it's alive and wet, it's just spectacular. Josie says Americans seem to be eating more seaweed, having learned from other cultures its health value, but we've long used seaweed derivatives. Uh, something called carrageenan uh, has been derived from Irish moss, a very, very common seaweed here on the eastern seaboard. Um, and it's the, that carrageenan that is used by chemical engineers to make uh, ice cream smooth in our mouth and to keep cottage cheese bound together and toothpaste uh, not fall off our, our toothbrush. Seaweeds are beautifully adapted to the chaos of losing their environment twice a day when the tide goes out. It's the phycocolloids in its cell walls. That's what keeps it moist uh, when the tide is out. And the seaweeds actually provide a haven. They hold the ocean there for a lot of uh, marine invertebrates that need to keep damp or away from, from the drying sun when the tide is out. Every cell of a seaweed gets its nutrients directly from the water, so seaweeds don't have roots like plants do. But seaweeds have a hold fast that anchors them to rocks or the ocean floor so they don't float away. Sometimes it's just a bit of sticky substance, and sometimes it grows quite large. The hold fast can be this um, rather elaborate uh, branching of haptera, which have kind of a magical glue that um, hold it to the floor. This is a dried holdfast, uh, and these um, would be in their, in, in life, uh, would be holding on to the bottom. Uh, but they've been worn away and make this fabulously sculptural element. And I have to say that as a visual artist, this is what I'm attracted to for. I want people to fall in love. I want them to fall in love with something they've never really considered before. What is it that makes seaweed beautiful in your eyes? The variety of form, the strength of form, um, and, and the color. It's stupendous. How can you beat it? That's our show for today. Next month, we'll bring you an all new show focusing on science and the arts. Everything from theater and dance to music and art. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks for joining us for Science and You.